Time for a hot take. Well, kind of a hot take. Bo Nix can win the Heisman in 2023. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time. Once again, for Locked on Ducks, I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you haven't already, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, wherever you listen to or watch the show. I don't have a preference personally. I appreciate you regardless. We've got lots to get to. Recruiting news, some of which might not be exactly what we want to hear. Going to depend on what happens today. Bo Nix, Heisman top talk, and then a hope for Oregon's defense. But Bo Nix can, in fact, win the Heisman in 2023. Now, there is a difference between can and will. But my contention that he can, I don't even think is too hot of a take. But today we're going to chart out what exactly that path would look like. So the preseason odds for the Heisman Trophy right now, Bo Nix has tied for the fifth best odds in the entire country to win the Heisman Trophy in 20. 20- Heisman Trophy in 2023. Oregon has had just one Heisman Trophy winner, that be in 2014. This guy named Marcus Mariota, you might have heard of him. He had a pretty good career with the Ducks, did a couple things that were significant, most notably winning two BCS slash New Year's Six games and appearing in a national championship game. Uh, and never won fewer than 11 games, I don't think, as, as a starter. That just kind of popped in my head. Yeah, it was a pretty good run. Anyway, so he has the same odds Bo Nix does as J.J. McCarthy, That's the Michigan quarterback. They've been in the playoff each of the last two years. Jordan Travis, hot, hot name in the college football world. Florida State's quarterback. Expectations are pretty high for the Seminoles this year with Mike Norvell. Drake May, a guy who's going to be probably the second pick, depending on who gets the second pick in the NFL draft in 2024. We saw him in the Holiday Bowl. We're able to relatively keep him quiet, at least in the second half of that game, compared to what he's capable of. But Did a good job holding him in that UNC offense offense to 27 points. Carson Beck, Sam Hartman, Kyle McCord. Those are kind of like the next tier names. But those guys all have plus 1,800 odds going into this season. Notably, those odds are all ahead, probably because of the position these guys play, of Marvin Harrison Jr., who I think is the best receiver in the country, probably one of the best receiver prospects we've ever seen. He's ridiculous. He could have a big year, but he needs someone to throw him the ball. Quarterbacks are always going to have an advantage in that sense. Bo Nix currently trails in the Heisman odds right now. Cade Klubnik, the Clemson quarterback, just ahead of him at plus 1,600. Michael Penix from UW at plus 1,200. Quinn Ewers. Jaden Daniels, according to FanDuel, is second. Yeah, our old friend from Arizona State kept us out of the playoff in 2019 with a big game. That Jaden Daniels at LSU, second in the preseason Heisman odds right now, according to FanDuel, number one is the returning Heisman winner, Caleb Williams. So it's not as if it's a ridiculous notion, but it's also not an easy path because winning the Heisman Trophy is about having more than just a great season individually. You have to have the right confluence of events. You have to have the right season. You have to have the right momentum. You have to have the right story to tell. Remember, the people who are deciding this stuff, they're voters, they're media members, right? Media members, yeah, they like a good story. Now, they like the best player as well. I think the Heisman has done a much better job than, say, the NBA MVP of choosing year by year who the best player in the country is, regardless of position. But Bonix certainly has a chance here because he is a quarterback. Oregon's a big-time program. We have high expectations, could have a great season. And he is a supremely talented player. And he's he's pretty much a household name in college football. He was a big-time recruit going to Auburn. His you know successes and failures at Auburn were well-documented and are well-understood by college football fans and the media writ large. And now at Oregon, coming off of an outstanding season in which he set the Ducks' single-season completion percentage record, he is set up for a fifth and final year of college football in which the expectations are understandably pretty high. So... In 2022, Bo Nix threw for just under 72% completion percentage. (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty good. 
just under 3,600 yards passing. He had 43 total touchdowns. 29 of them were throwing. 14 of them were rushing. He was masterful, of course, with that quarterback sneak. I suspect we'll see that again this year. He threw seven picks. He had 510 rushing yards. Now compare that to what Caleb Williams did in 2022 who completed 67% of his passes, threw for over 4,500 yards, so almost 1,000 more yards in the air, 52 total touchdowns, 42 of which were passing, which is a lot, 10 of which were rushing, five interceptions, 382 rushing yards. So Bo Nix had a little bit more production on the ground. Caleb Williams had significantly more production throwing the ball through the air. So that brings us to the question, what would Bo Nix need to do in order to win the Heisman Trophy? What has to happen if he's going to do that? And again, I reiterate, this is possible. I'm not saying likely. A lot of things have to go right, but the path is pretty clear. It looks something like this. So first thing that has to happen, Bo Nix needs to not get hurt. It, that, that would help. <laughs> you know, an injury that helped contribute to two losses in three weeks, knocked Oregon out of the playoff conversation, that would certainly help. So you have to stay healthy for the entire season, right? We all understand that because you have to be able to produce week in and week out, put up big numbers, and you have to keep your team in contention. And that's the next part of this. If Bo Nix is going to win the Heisman or have a chance to, which by the way, he was climbing up the Heisman odds when Oregon was in the midst of that glorious eight game winning streak from a season ago. Bo Nix was right in the thick of things because he was right at the center of what we were doing offensively and the success we had. And yeah, there was plenty of talk about Lanning and him being a young coach and being a new coach and having success. But Bo Nix was a big, big part of that story last season. So it's not as if we haven't seen him enter the Heisman race before or at least be in the conversation at a significant point in the season beyond just the preseason, the way we're talking about him right now, because that's all we have. But guess what? Football is a lot closer than you think. But the other thing that has to happen here is Bo Nix has to lead Oregon to the college football playoff. Because if you're going to be a Heisman Trophy winner and your team doesn't make it to the college football playoff, you have to put up some crazy stupid numbers like Caleb Williams did whose team did not make the playoff, but he was not just a good quarterback on a great team. He was an unbelievably great quarterback on a great team. And they did not get to the playoff. But the thing is, look at the gap that I highlighted earlier in how many yards Bo Nix threw for last year and Caleb Williams did. Philosophically, I don't expect, even with Will Stein back there as as the offensive coordinator, not Kenny Dillingham, I don't expect Oregon's offensive approach to dramatically change. So I think if Bo Nix has another good, productive, successful season, he could throw for more than 3,600 yards. He could maybe push towards 4,000. I don't expect that he would be able to get in the 4,500 range. So Caleb Williams was boosting his own Heisman candidacy by putting up crazy numbers and making amazing plays. I think Bo Nix can make great plays, can put up really good numbers, but I think he needs the team component as well. So he would have to lead Oregon to the college football playoff, which is attainable, not easy, but attainable. But there is one other thing I think that he would have to do as as a quarterback. There are two other things he would need in order to actually break through and become Oregon's second ever Heisman Trophy winner. It's not impossible, but it's certainly not easy. Betting on FanDuel is easy, though, because when you go take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel, you can get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. So just bet $20, and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's $200 you can spend betting everything from the money line or the over-under to who you think is going to hit the first home run, all in an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you for allowing me another second segment sip. A deep breath to recuperate myself and we continue with the show. The two other things that Bo Nix would need to win the Heisman Trophy. Number one, I think you have to throw for at least 4,000 yards. 
He was just seven yards shy of 3,600 a year ago. That would have to hit 4,000. Recent history indicates that you need to be able to reach that threshold because each of the last three Heisman winning quarterbacks have all hit 4,000 yards. And they were all in much more pass happy offenses, which is why I reiterate that Oregon has to have the college football playoff component to create that extra momentum and give Bo Nix that sort of boost. Because the last three quarterbacks to win the Heisman, Caleb Williams threw for 4,500 yards. Bryce Young was in the 4,800 yard range. That's an Alabama single season passing yards record. Joe Burrow, 2019, 5,600 yards. Oh, that team. That, 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 in my view, is the greatest college football team we've ever seen. 2019 LSU. They were ridiculous. So Bo Nix would have to get to the 4,000-yard clip, I think, to get over that. He might not need that to be a finalist, right? If Oregon wins the Pac-12, goes 12-1, and and Bo has a great season, his numbers are similar to last year, good chance he could be a finalist in that instance. But if he wants to actually win it, if we want him to actually win it, probably need to be producing a level that sees him go over 4,000 yards passing or maybe up the rushing production, right? Like he runs more than than any of those three quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Bryce Young, or Joe Burrow. So, you know, 510 yards and 14 rushing touchdowns certainly helps contribute to the sort of stats that garner a Heisman candidate. But I think if he were to, you know, be in the 500 rushing yards range again, which might have been more had he not gotten injured, Right, because he was literally immobile against Utah. I mean, okay, technically he could move. He made like one throw on the run. He dived forward on third and one to end the game. But other than that, he wasn't moving. So maybe that could be closer to six, seven hundred yards rushing if if he hadn't been injured there. But I, I think overall he's got to eclipse the four thousand benchmark. And then the last thing. Oregon's got to win big games, play in big games on national television that garner a lot of hype, a lot of attention. You probably need game day to be on an Oregon game at least once, maybe twice. I would look at the Utah, USC, and Washington games as candidates for that. But he's also got to have that moment, right? He's got to have that moment where he solidifies. If his candidacy is on fire for the Heisman and he's in the running, he looks like he's going to be a finalist. You got to have the moment, right? For Mariota, it was the leap over the Oregon State player down in Corvallis when we were blowing him out. And he goes over the guy and almost replicates the Heisman pose in midair. I think you got to have one of those moments too. So there is a path for Bo Nix to win the Heisman Trophy this year. Is it an easy one? No, certainly not. Is it entirely dependent on him? Also, no. He did everything he needed to, save for getting a touchdown on the last drive. But again, you're not going to be perfect down there. He did everything he needed to to win the game against Washington. Defense let him down. That has to be. When quarterbacks go up there and say, I got to thank my teammates, thank my offensive line, they're not doing that just to look good and sound gratuitous. They need those other guys to have that caliber of season. But is it possible? Yes, it is possible. A lot of other great players in the country who you can make the can't make, make, make the argument for. But there is certainly a chance. And it is something to watch. So we'll hope for the best on that front. We are also hoping for the best on the commitment front. So not the greatest piece of news that I was getting earlier today as I record this show. Sounds like Max Torres and Justin Hopkins have both issued pieces or predictions that Oregon will not be getting five-star edge Elijah Rushing, who might have committed while you're listening to or watch this show. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but it looks like the Ducks are not going to land him, which is a disappointment to be sure. If he does end up going elsewhere, and those predictions have been uh, favoring Arizona, if that ends up happening, which again, has not happened by the time I'm recording the show, all subject to change. Oregon needs to go out and find a five-star edge player in the 2024 class because That was a guy they'd been looking at for a long time. It's a guy they'd been in at for a long time. We talked with Brian Smith earlier earlier this week, who said it was down to Oregon and Tennessee. Now it looks like Arizona's kind of getting into the ring with a late push here. It's not the end of the world, but it's also not great. I, I had long been thinking, yeah, it looks like we're going to be getting Elijah Rushing. And if he ends up choosing to go elsewhere, Oregon now has to go back to the drawing board 
on figuring out who they're going to get as kind of their premier edge player. Because you need to be bringing in, for my money, a high-level edge player. If you're Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoi and defensive linemen, like, you should be aiming for one big-time defensive lineman at least and one big-time edge player. And if I had to choose, I would take edge because as we saw with Kayvon Thibodeau, you can have solid to mildly above average play and have one great edge player, or from the interior, I mean, and then one great edge player just wreaks havoc on a defense. That's in a pass-happy world of football. That's what you need there. So hopefully that ends up going our way. I'm not counting on it, though, at this point, which sucks because I kind of was for a while. But Oregon's going to have to go back to the drawing board there, but we'll wait to see what what happens there. Um, Arizona, Notre Dame, UCLA, Miami, Washington, Tennessee are the schools that we're all in after him, but it looks like Arizona is the school that, uh, that might end up grabbing him there. So he's committing today. Dylan Williams, four-star linebacker from the state of California, he's committing tomorrow, July 7th. Michigan State, Miami, and UCLA are the players there. July 10th, that's next week, Kamar Mathudi is choosing between Oregon, Michigan State, Utah, and Washington are considered to be the contending schools there. And then a guy we haven't talked about on the show, but we certainly will leading up to his commitment on July 16th, four-star offensive lineman Preston Taumua from the state of Hawaii, Arizona, Auburn, Nebraska, and Alabama. Interesting con- consortium of schools there are all are all in on him. So those are the dates to watch for with upcoming commitments for players that Oregon is after. My priorities of the group would be rushing number one is do what you can to get him back on the Oregon side of things. If you can't do that, I, I think Dylan Williams or Kamar Mathudi, whichever one, I, I, I think both have you know very similar upside. They play the same position. They're both five-star linebackers. I think that th- those are guys, they're both from the state of California. I haven't broken down each guy's film at this point in time, but I think that given where Oregon's class is looking right now, position-wise and depth-wise, that's probably priority number two and Talmua number three. And look, I, I'm not saying to not go after Talmua, but offensive line wise, you've already got uh, four offensive linemen committed and you're chasing Brandon Baker. And that's the sort of can't miss prospect that you would you know, give up a couple other players to go and get. So I'd say that'd be how I would like to prioritize these, these recruitments is rushing one, the linebackers two, and Talmua three. But these guys will all be uh, verbally committed here within the next 10 days or so. We'll see how many, uh, if any, I suspect Oregon won't miss out on all of them, how many they're able to land and whether or not names start to pop up on Oregon's radar on on the recruiting trail. Uh, Which leads me into a great question that came in, which all of you can do as well. Drop them in the YouTube comments or hit me up on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. DMs and mentions wide open. This one straight from the Locked on Ducks Twitter mentions. This from Joe Duck. Hey, Spencer, two questions. One, with the 24 class being mostly full, what positions are still the biggest need for the Ducks? Two, it seems that most upcoming commitments are on the defensive side of the ball, correct? Do you think our class is mostly set on offense? So if rushing commits to the Ducks, I would still go after a high-level edge player, but it would drop in terms of my priority. If rushing ends up going elsewhere, then edge is your number one priority now for the Ducks. That is where their recruiting focus needs to be. You need to find this year's Mateo, this year's Kayvon Thibodeau. If you're going to build the sort of defense that we think Dan Lanning and Tosh Lupoi want to build in Eugene, you have to have premier edge players. And you can't, do, you can't build what they want to build and what Dan Lanning built at Georgia. You can't do that without being really, really good in the trenches. So you need interior def- defensive linemen, yes, but you got to find some big time edge dudes. And if you want to continue to have a great defense, not just for one year, but year after year, got to be recruiting these kids every single cycle. So when I look at Oregon's class, they have an edge player in there, a four star by the name of Jackson Jones from, from Yuma, Arizona. You still want to go after a big time five star, you know, big recruiting battle sort of guy the way that rushing is. And I, I think there, you know, Jordan Ross would be a name uh, to watch on that front. But again, we'll just kind of fully reassess that after uh, after the fact. So 
with regards to the rest of your question, though, I don't agree with the first part that the 24 class is mostly full. They're sitting at 18 hard commits for, for the 2024 recruiting cycle. They had a lot more than that, 29, as a matter of fact, in 2023. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to be in the 28, 29 range again, but I'd expect them to at least get 25. I, I, I would think 25 is kind of the range we're looking at. So I don't think the class is mostly full. I do, however, think it's mostly set on offense. I think there are a couple outstanding pieces, you know, recruiting wise to look at. But offense, you've got your two quarterbacks. We're done there. They've got one running back, right? Dewan or Dejon Riggs. I think they could definitely add another one. I don't think taking two is ridiculous. They did that this year, right, with Jaden Lamar and Dante Dowdell. I think another running back is probably your top priority offensively after Brandon Baker. But you've got four offensive linemen. You've got three receivers. You could add another receiver in the portal era. I don't know that you need to necessarily, but you could add another wide receiver to the class. They've got two tight ends. You could add one more. You got four offensive linemen. You could add Baker. You could add uh, Taumua as well. It's not as if there's such a bad, such a thing as having too many good players on the roster, right? Like having guys transfer because there's too much talent there. Hey, like that's, that's a good problem to have. That's a problem you want to have from a recruiting standpoint. So I think defensive end slash edge, whatever you want to call that position, I think that's your biggest priority remaining pending what Elijah Rushing does whenever you listen to or watch this show. And when you look at the rest of the class, I, I, I think corner is another spot where where they're light. They've got just one uh, right now. Now, they took a lot of corners in the 2023 cycle, so I don't expect them to be quite as heavy there, but I think they've got a pair of safeties. I think they're good there. Linebacker, defensive line, those would be the position groups where I'd say you're probably going to see Oregon continue to make more moves, and it's where we're hearing they're going to make more moves, right? Dylan, what, like, you don't have, uh, to my knowledge, I'm just double checking here in, in the class, I don't think they have an actual linebacker committed, and they, they do not yet for 2024. So that'd probably be your top priority in, in the cycle, right? Is like, not that you're not going to go after a Williams Winery, but if you're talking, you know, positionally, what do they still need? What are we still going to see? Williams Winery, by the way, five star probably number one overall defensive lineman in the class from uh, the St. Louis area. Oregon is recruiting him. Uh, I've also heard, you know, Brian Smith talked about yesterday, David Stone is going to Oklahoma, or at least that's the way it's looking right now. So that's not going to happen. He's another five-star defensive lineman. So I'd say linebacker should be a position of priority. I think front seven really is where the focus needs to be for the Ducks, given what you brought in in 2023, given what you brought in in or what you have so far in, in 2024. Now, there are a lot of defensive linemen who are four stars from the 2023 cycle. Doesn't mean you ever stop adding talent, right? Like that's that's the world of, of recruiting here. So I'd say linebacker or edge first, linebacker second, corner third. But I don't think corner's a, a massive priority. I, I think, frankly, you need a running back more than you need a corner because Oregon's got so many corners on their roster who have a lot of eligibility left, who are still young players. You have Roderick Pleasant and Dalen Austin, who, who will be coming in this fall. You've got Cole Martin in the mix. Jaleel Florence is going to be a sophomore. Triquez Bridges, I think, has another year a after this season. I'd have to uh, double check that, which I will uh, one, one second. But I, I just think overall that's not as big of a need. Yeah, he's a junior this year. So Triquez could be back for another season unless he, you know, bumps up his NFL draft stock this season, has a really good year, which I think he could be poised, poised to do. But those are the timelines. Those are what I say the priorities are, uh, you know, position-wise. But I, I agree that we're mostly set on offense. I think you could see another wide receiver. I think you could definitely see another running back. And offensive line would be the places. But tight end, quarterback, uh, we're, we're mostly good right there. Let's keep going through the mailbag here. Uh, on what is going to be the last show of the week. I know, boo Spencer, but that's why we had a Saturday show to try to give you the same amount of shows over the course of two weeks. No show tomorrow. 
Probably not going to do a show for Monday, and I'll be back in your feeds on on Tuesday. Uh, I'll be in in a place also within the state of Oregon where internet is just not as uh, as accessible. Going to a family cabin. So, Bud asks, mailbag. Gang Green is likely my favorite moniker for the Ducks defense. Do you have any suggested nicknames for the future that would add some more spice to our identity? offense, defense, or entire team, and we could open that up to your creative duck followers. So first of all, I agree. YouTube comments, go crazy. Do what you like. Here's where I don't agree. That right now, the Oregon defense is at the point where it deserves a name. So the Pittsburgh Steelers have had great defenses over the years, right? And it eventually became known as the Steel Curtain. But before you can talk about giving a nickname to a unit, it's got to earn the nickname, okay? The blur offense, going warp speed, those nicknames or references to the Chip Kelly days came after they started dominating everybody. So I'm not even going to, all due respect, bud, you know I love and appreciate that that you're an everyday, or not just on Locked on Ducks, but on Locked on Pac-12 as well. I'm not even going to entertain the notion that the defense deserves a nickname because my hope for Oregon's defense is that one day they become dominant enough to even deserve that discussion, but they aren't there yet and they've got a ways to go and they've got to build up through the recruiting classes that they've got and they have to be better on the field. And that's why we're talking about all these guys and them getting better and such. So that's my honest answer to that. You can drop comments below. I'll, you know, listen to ideas, have them in the back of my mind if we ever get there. But until Oregon goes out and has a truly dominant defensive season, I don't think you get a nickname for that side of the ball. Offensively, I just want to be a really good offense. And you don't need to have, you know, something like the blur offense from from back in the day. And you're not going to have something like that again. Just line up and go kick some butt and take names. Last question. This is a fun one. Autzen Zone asks... Hey, Spence, what kind of music are you into? Do you have any favorite bands, artists, the people need to know? I love this question. Give me a sec. Had to freshen up the throat. Freshen up the pipes, as they say, in the singing world. I do have a favorite type of music. Classic hits of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm not entirely against newer songs. However... Do I listen to a lot of new music? No. What is my most played playlist on Spotify? Classics, by far. And I am into all the heavy hitters. My number one guy, 1A is Billy Joel, 1B is Elton John. Elvis, awesome. Eagles, great. Beatles, fantastic. Neil Diamond, superb. But if you just go down and play the biggest hits of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, those are my jam. And this all stems from a love of Guardians of the Galaxy and the music that's in there. That's how I first got into this sort of stuff. You know, songs like Ain't No High by Martin Gaye or Bring It On Home To Me by Sam Cooke or, um, gosh, there's so many good ones in there. Lakeshore Drive by Aliotta Haynes. Those are some of my favorites in there. My favorite song ever is Piano Man. It's like Piano Man, Tiny Dancer, and then honestly, maybe Hound Dog by Elvis. Like, gotten really into Elvis over the last couple of months. So, I am all about the classics. I am an old soul in that sense. You will not find me listening to Lizzo or Taylor Swift or any. I don't have anything against these people. I just, it doesn't, um, it just doesn't do it for me. Or there's like a SZA, SCA, or something like that. I don't know. None of that does it for me. I am a classic hits kind of guy. I'm always combing through and trying to add to the playlist. And, uh, you know, Billy Joel is my number one. He's 1A, like Bucky Irving. And then 1B, Noah Whittington, that's Elton John. Either one can be a number one given the current day, given the mood, given the vibe, whoever's got the hot hand. But I'd say Billy Joel number one. I would love to see him in concert one day. I'm not a big concert guy. I like just listen to music when I want to listen to music, mostly in the car, but or in the shower. Music in the shower is elite. But 
Billy Joel is the one guy who I would love to see in concert one day. And I'm sad I don't get to see Elton in concert because he's only over in London. I'm not going to go all the way over there for that. But those are kind of my top guys. Curi- I know I've got some some listeners or viewers out there who are, are definitely of that generation, music-wise. Would love to hear your thoughts on, on who I should be checking out. But that that is my top. Billy Joel, Elton John. Elvis, those are probably my top three. El- Elvis over the last couple months, ever since the movie came out, which is great, Fast Riser, man. I tell you, Fast Riser on my list and his, I used to not like his slow songs. I just liked his fast ones. Then I listened to some of his slower ones. Whew, man, so, so very, very good. Love that question. As always, keep them coming. YouTube comments or on Twitter at Smalls underscore 55 or at Locked on Ducks. DMs and mentions wide open. Probably going to be back in your feeds on Tuesday. We'll see if anything changes and if I can record a show for you all on Monday. But until then, appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And as always, go Ducks.